start the lecture. Yeah. Yes. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, so today I will talk about um, uh, are some artificial intelligence, which is are big words, uh, but uh, we're starting to get there, I think, uh, past the present and future. Um, so first of all, I have to uh, thank our team uh, from the lab here at Purdue and other team members across the globe that have contributed to these projects. And uh, without them, uh, you, this presentation would be fairly empty. <laughs> So I want to start, um, um, so we work in, in the area of uh, deep learning, which is basically very big neural networks. So it's, a, it's an old field, you know, started many years ago, uh, that has became more popular recently because of the availability of uh, more data um, and a better hardware, more algorithm and better. But the algorithm has stayed fairly similar. So there's, of course, there's a, there's an enormous, uh, um, uh, every day there's a, uh, there are new, new improvements on this algorithm, but the, really, the, the core uh, is uh, uh, stayed the same. So I want to give you some history first. So in the field of uh, uh, deep learning and, and the use of practical use of deep neural network started in the 90s where uh, Jan LeCun uh, developed a system basically using analyzing images that was in a little bit vaguely inspired by the brain and the visual, our visual system. And he had this ability of uh, recognizing handwritten character. You know, when you, when you write a uh, character, uh, uh, there's a big variation from person to person. And uh, this was very difficult for a computer to, to hard code, uh, to write a program that would uh, include all this variation that we have in, in handwriting. Uh, and this is very typical of of pretty much any image, basically. If we want to interpret an image, we do it very well because we have a sophisticated neural network, but computers uh, were not really able to do that. And, and for 50, 60 years, people have tried to do this, uh, basically analyze images or videos and uh, uh, with different ideas, they thought it would be easier, but for 50, 60 years, there was very little progress until um, we got to Jan, basically. Um, so now, uh, fast forward a few years, uh, we, because, of, because of cell phones, you know, this device that you carry with you all the time that uh, included a camera, all of a sudden we had uh, millions and millions of, of images, lots of data. Uh, not only we had the images, but the people were labeling them. Uh, you would write a caption on your image or you would try to label it. So uh, we basically had a lot of annotated image an image and some description of its content, right? And this started uh, not in 2012, but a little bit, I would say in the 90s, but slowly, right? I remember my first phone was just clamshell with taking little pictures. And now uh, the phones that we have, uh, you know, can take pretty serious pictures. They're not as good as DS DSLR, like that one. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, you know, nobody goes around with a DSLR anymore unless they want to take a you know, very fancy pictures, right? So by annotating all these images um, and knowing what's, the, what's in the image, then we could train a neural network, which is just an algorithm, by giving them examples. So uh, we show them an image and we say, OK, this is an image of a cat. And we say, this is cat. And then dog, and this is dog. A little bit like uh, we learn when we're, when we're little, right? Uh, our parents show us things, and they give us examples. Um, so, so here we trained um, a few years ago. This is a work uh, from, from Alfredo, who sits in the audience back there. And um, um, uh, we trained a very large neural network with uh, more than 5,000 categories. This was uh, two years ago. At the time, it was uh, state of the art. I think it's still not, you don't see this many <laughs> examples like this around, unless you know you're at Google or Facebook. Um, and so um, the reason why we were able to do this is we, um, we had a computer with a lot of GPUs that could do a lot of linear algebra <laughs> and, um, and to train these things. And uh, also we had a pretty good data set of uh, ten, tens of millions of images. Um, and so the network was, it was trained to recognize objects of everyday life. And now it became a little bit very useful uh, because, you know, it could really start interpreting uh, what this is in the image. So now, this is not always perfect, uh, but um, 
trust me if I say that, you know, at the time this was a really state of the art and he beat all other algorithms that were basically hard coded, right? Um, and then uh, the year after, in 2013, um, so soon after the development of this, uh, the ability to analyze images and text, so um, uh, people also revived recurrent neural network, which are basically neural network that learn sequences, right? And then writing is just a sequence, you know, with a pen, a uh, sequence of XY coordinate, right? So they train a neural network to, to write uh, from text to, to write and, and written character by just producing this coordinate. And by cha changing simple parameters of this neural network, you could get very different uh, writing styles that pretty much look uh, human because this network was trained on human and writing. Um, and so uh, this actually, we need to go back to a few years, to 97 and maybe even before. Uh, so people uh, were working on recurrent neural network for a long time. A recurrent neural network is just a neural network that has a memory of the past, basically. So it has some, some state uh, that holds a memory, right? The problem was training them. Um, it was very hard to remember long uh, sequences because uh, these neural networks start forgetting older things. Um, it, it didn't have the ability of deciding what to remember and what not. Right, and this neural network is basically similar to the neural network for images where you give an image, the neural network A processes and it gives you like a category. Uh, but it is also another output that basically goes to the next output and the next output and the next output. Uh, you know, I don't want to go into a lot of details, but then uh, in 97, um, a, gr um, a group um, uh, in Switzerland developed um, a recipe for training this uh, uh, recurrent neural network, which he, basically they had a, a sophisticated uh, a cell neuron uh, that had the ability to turn on and off uh, or decide when you wanted to remember something, think an input or output something. Um, and so basically he gated uh, this input and he had the ability of controlling uh, this, uh, the information, the flow of information by learning it. So and with this you could do uh, very interesting things. So, so like the, this is an example from our lab where we uh, train a, t uh, a recurrent neural network to translate from one language to the other. So now if you, get, if you, have a, if you guys use Google Translate, uh, you're basically using this kind of neural network every day. So what they do is you input a sequence in one language and you give them a stop character. And then um, you give them a lot of example, one sentence in one language and a sentence in the other language. And then the network learns the correspondence, actually learns both, uh, learns the language model of both of the languages. And um, um, what's interesting is it's learning it character by character. Um, so it doesn't really know what it's saying really, but it just, it just uh, uh, learns correspondence between words and, 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 and to make uh, sensible sentences. So if you start a sentence, then it is able to, to translate it or continue the sentence. Uh, so this was very, very interesting work that uh, you, you're actually using every day, you just don't know maybe. Then another application of these two things combined that I showed you, so both the ability to analyze an image, but also the ability to, uh, to create language is uh, in, in this example where uh, you have um, a neural network that can take an image and can provide a textual description or a caption of, uh, of such image. Uh, not only can provide a description, but whenever he utter, utters a word, he knows what features represent that word in the image. So there's a correspondence between visual knowledge and, uh, and, and sort of um, uh, language knowledge, right? Um, that is very interesting and it took a lot of people by surprise. This is just uh, two years ago, by the way, when we got these really, really interesting results and now they're just uh, getting better and better. Um, so in 2015 also is the, the year of the face detection <laughs> in the sense that uh, uh, deep neural network, uh, this is an example from our lab. Uh, I can. I can probably mute that, but okay. Uh, so the idea was that uh, this deep neural network actually became better than humans in recognizing faces. 
better than humans because we had uh, suddenly we had enormous amount of data, right? We have uh, yeah. Facebook has uh, millions and billions of of images of faces that, that you guys label every time you say, "Oh, I'm in this picture, I'm in that picture," and with this data, you can train a neural network to detect faces that does better than you guys do because you know you. Uh, we usually just remember maybe a thousand faces more or less in our daily life. I mean, this thing can remember millions, can parse an entire city, you know, without any problem. Uh, and uh, uh, this is also a very recent work from, from Abby, who's also sitting in the audience there. And we'll give some presentation poster later. Um, so this is uh, the use of uh, an extension of what you've seen before, uh, categorizing images but it's applied to an entire scene. And we basically we ask the question, what is in this scene? Uh, label every pixel with some categories. Um, and this is uh, uh, this kind of algorithm that you see over here is used by all the, the major car company now to create autonomous vehicles. Uh, basically, they use a camera with this kind of algorithm, uh, partly inspired by, by ours, we get requests almost every day from a repository that we, that we put online uh, uh, from major car company, including Tesla and so forth. And they use basically variation of this uh, to, to parse the scene and figure out where is the road and is there something in front of the car. Because no matter what it is, we don't even need to categorize it. We shouldn't, we shouldn't go over it, <laughs> right? Especially if it's people or, or building, right? So, but this, uh, this neural network, is basically trained to uh, at every every part of the image, which is a large image, is trained to to analyze this image and decide what's in there. And this neural network uh, uh, also not only compresses the image into a code, so like a cat category, but it also uncompresses the category back to the image because it has to draw very precise contour on on the image plane. So. This network can compress and decompress, and they're called encoder or decoders. Um, last year, also, there were uh, a lot of excitement in the field of super resolution, where you could take an image like uh, uh, this one here on the on, on the left, uh, um, that is uh, of low quality because maybe you downloaded it off the web or uh, it was blurry or something, and. Uh, because you, you provided the network a lot of example of, basically you took a picture and you down sample, you reduce the resolution, right? And you provided these two examples to the network. He said, when you see this low resolution, give me the high resolution. You give a lot of example to this network, this encoder decoder architecture, and they can basically learn how to um, interpolate pixel and basically recreate pixels that, that are not there in the image. So they can create data. Based on, based on the statistics of image that they learned. Okay, so this is just, in a way, this is just uh, brute force uh, statistical inference, right? The same thing that you can do is uh, if you have a picture of your cat, now you can transfer the style of a famous painting. This neural network can analyze the style of an image and separate style from content and use the style uh, to attach it to your picture so that they can then present your cat just like a famous painting would have been able to draw it. Um, and this is more than just for fun, you know. You can take a, uh, mundane pictures like we take uh, when we go on a trip like this one and say, hey, I want it to look like uh, National Geographic. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then you run these algorithms and there it goes, right? So, um, so you can create, uh, this neural network can can create, uh, in a way, can start to create art, right? And uh, there are some examples where they, uh, now that uh, they've been used before to create music, and now they're used to create more and more sophisticated uh, images as well. And, and some of this stuff is very artistic, so it's used even to convert movies. The movie industry uses them to, to process entire scene automatically, which was very tedious work on Photoshop before. And you can, you can tell Photoshop, hey, give me this style of images. You don't really have to spend hours and hours. So it's very, you know, it's very, it's very interesting if you're the artistic kind. Um, then uh, this is like a more recent uh, application that we developed. 
so uh, for augmented reality where you know for example you're in a store and if you're like me you have like a list on your phone that it's all uh, you know, the things are in different places and you end up going around the store 20 times to find items. But so here we can use this neural network, you know, if I put my phone here in my pocket, it can look where I'm going and it actually can identify products on both sides and tell me, hey, pick up the coffee on the left or pick up the banana on the right. So as you go. Um, and you'll see more uh, of this exciting application when we will have more of a wearable um, devices like uh, Google Glass or things like this uh, but for now it they will also run on your phone and you're very familiar with augmented reality because of many many of you played Pokemon Go probably um, well so the difference between Pokemon Go and this is that Pokemon Go doesn't really analyze the scene doesn't know what, it presents a Pokemon but it doesn't know where to put it so it could be floating anywhere this instead if you analyze the scene, you can place items. I can place a check checkerboard here and play chess with you, you know. And uh, it's a virtual chessboard, but we can all use it, right? So yeah, there there's a lot of exciting application. But okay, this sounds this sounds great. Uh, lots of interesting things, especially if you haven't seen them. Uh, but this is a AI, right? This is this uh, intelligence uh, because you know the goal for us really is to try to recreate uh, uh, our human intelligence and our human capabilities and not only that but go beyond them as fast as possible um, because humans have their problems. Uh, so uh, in reality what you've seen up, up to now is basically all categorization. So it means the categorization means I get an input and I put it in a box okay, of similar things that I know. Right? Uh, that that is not really that is not really intelligence. It's all these algorithms that you see. They just do fancy version of categorizations. So how can we do more more interesting things? Uh, and why should we do more interesting things, right? So um, if we live in an environment and we evolved over over the years uh, to to have a certain function, like you know this. Uh, uh, this butterfly or moth that basically uh, have a sort of like a predator uh, bird eye uh, on their wings to, to scare out uh, the smaller birds, right? So that they don't get eaten. Um, so we have to somehow, this algorithm, not only have to learn some correspondence or categorization, but they have to, they have to perform in our environment. That's when they're going to start to be useful for us. We're going to have robots that do things for us. Uh, things we don't want to do or things that we shouldn't do and we could do better things not to take our jobs um, so uh, somehow uh, you know in biological systems uh, they learn to uh, to violate the second law of thermodynamics because uh, basically they don't just fall to the minimum energy level but they fight you know they fight for resources they work with the environment to try to extract energy and resources from the environment in order to proliferate and thrive, right? Um, and uh, in fact, you know, we are all like this little mouse every day. We go through our daily life uh, by finding finding resources, finding food. It's easier for us now because we, we build all these societies that does things for us, um, but ultimately, uh, we still need these things. We're still some biological entity that needs uh, um, and needs food and uh, entertainment uh, of, all, of all kinds and so forth. So, so but if you want to uh, if you want to live in an environment, then um, you have to do more than just observe it. So, um, uh, this is a, a picture that I took from uh, a Carl Friston paper. Um, and uh, uh, basically, I'm, I'm quite interested about this loop up here, right? So the loop is, I'm in an environment, I observe the environment, I, I know the state of the environment, I know my state. State means, you know, what's going on around, where are my limbs, am I sitting, sleeping, or something. And uh, based on the environment, I have to interact with the environment, so I have to I have to somehow generate some control action or signal. We, we just don't stand there and observe, just like the algorithm that I showed you before. But we have to move and, and, uh, and learn from the environment. 
Right, so there's a theory of how the brain works that says that you know the brain is basically designed to minimize uh, error. It just predicts all the time. It's, it predicts what's going to happen in front of you so that you're prepared for it to do the best action. And, um, and this is just a, you know, it's a theory and Carl Friston is, um, is, is, is one of the, the, the people that have um, talked about it, but it's it, um, where I took these pictures, but it's really a lot of people that, that believe something like this. So let's fast forward, you know, just like a couple of, couple of, uh, far, not fast forward, but let's go back just a couple of years. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, to 2013. So in 2013, a group, uh, DeepMind, that was not that, then bought by Google, um, basically um, applied this neural network to play video games. Hey, and these video games are basically like a small environment, right? It's hard to build a robot and start to do sophisticated things. Let's start for something simple. Like if you can play these video games, you are actually, neural network has to move this battle. So not only observe, but also move it. And it has to learn to do that, right? Um, so the way they did this is um, they, they recorded a human player and then again they showed the net, you know, neural network what you would do. There's, uh, there are some algorithms uh, there on uh, reinforcement learning. Um, but the reinforcement learning here is only like a small piece of this problem. The big problem is uh, try to understand uh, what's going on in the scene and learn the rules of the game faster. So all the neural network was given was the score actually as a result, say so it maximized the score. It's not even given the rules. Maybe a little brutal, right? Uh, but um, if you spend enough time, then it will learn to do this. Um, it will learn to play after a while. Um, but unfortunately, it just needs a lot of data to do this because it basically starts from zero. And now you learn this game, and I want to play another game. Well, it won't, it won't be able to play because it's never, it never seen that game. So you cannot transfer learn like we do. I go online, I, I don't know how to cook something, I go on YouTube, look at a video, and boom, I transfer learn from Google to me, right? So we need to do this kind of stuff um, if we want to do better AI. So another example of uh, DeepMind, which really has a deep mind, they're really smart guys, <laughs> is that uh, they also um, uh, beat many human champions in, in the game of Go, which was considered very difficult because the board is so large. Uh, but yet, you know, again, by brute forcing uh, large neural networks, lots of data, lots of time to train, uh, eventually this algorithm by just learns to do just this, it, it got better than humans. And in deep learning and neural network, this is just a norm. Uh, slowly, one by one, every year we're gonna beat humans in some task and there's no way around it. That's what we want, really, right? Because, you know, now everybody's talking about autonomous cars, right? And uh, would you want a car that is worse than you in driving? No, you want a car that is better than you, uh, drives better than you, doesn't sleep, uh, doesn't get distracted by text. And we have it, right? Lots of, lots of companies already built it. We're just waiting for these car companies to finally get together and and decide to bring it to, to the market for a decent price. But it's, it's already here, guys, you know, so we need to push this guy a little bit, I think. Um, but yeah, so this is really the first robot that is gonna help us in an everyday life um, because it is actually observing the environment and is moving, it's taking actions in the environment. It's not just sitting there. And we wanted to make the best action because these things are dangerous not just for us, but also people around. Um, so in the past, people were doing things like this, categorizing. They took a piece, a piece, pieces of the image and they tried to categorize it into track, building. Hey, but who cares about this stuff, really, right? Who cares about this? Do you go around and label every object when you drive? No. <laughs> what, when you drive, you try to find the road. Where, where can I go? Where is the road? And you try to figure out things, um, parts of the image where you cannot drive. This is how we do it. Um, so that's what, you know, Abby did uh, sort of end to end. Okay, but all, all of this is, is great, but unfortunately, to, these neural networks are very computationally intensive. So if you wanna process an image, um, like a car, car frontal view, 
right, with a decent uh, resolution, maybe 720p, and you want to probably go at some 30 frames per second. So that requires uh, processing of several t <coughs> trillion operations per second. Okay, so that's not, that's not trivial. You need some serious hardware. Actually, we do have this hardware. I mean, uh, many of you have a laptop. If you have a gaming laptop or if you have a PC at home with a GPU, with a graphic card, you have that kind of processing power. And we use that kind of hardware to, um, uh, to train this neural network. Um, unfortunately, they take a lot of batteries, right? So this is the kind of uh, devices that uh, NVIDIA has been pushing for a while, but it's not the only one, AMD also, um, and other manufacturer. Uh, so these are just processor with uh, so many cores. They have uh, 3,000 cores, and the latest, I think the latest card can do 47 trillion operations per second for about three, 400 watts. Unfortunately, I cannot put that in my phone. And I want to do that because you know, I want to go around and have uh, the phone help me in my everyday life. I can also cannot put it in a drone and I cannot put it in a small robot that goes around and finds my keys. Uh, so, and all the operation that really we're doing here in, in this neural network or, uh, or the, the majority of it is just a simple linear algebra. It's like a matrix to vector, a matrix to matrix to matrix multiplication. So just lots of multiplication, lots of addition. We study very complex math, but at the end of the day, it boils down to <laughs> just uh, multiply and add. Um, and uh, so we, in the lab, we developed many generation of uh, special hardware uh, that is actually better than these GPUs uh, if you implement them on a chip, in especially in performance per watt. And the latest one is called Snowflake. And if you want a demo, come to our lab. Um, so what is the, what is the future? Or, and this is, this is my view, so I'll take it with a grain of salt. Um, so right now, you know, our computers or, uh, or our devices cannot tell the difference between this image and, and this image, right? It's a very different image, but you know, it looks the same. It looks the same to them. Uh, they can categorize and say, oh, there's two people, and maybe they can categorize the hugging. But they cannot understand the subtle difference that we can, right? So we need to be able to not only look at images, but we need to look at videos or sequence of images. Obviously, we humans don't need to see a video here because we, have, we, we know what's happening here, right? We have seen several, several instances of this. So we can kind of, if we see this image, we project to a video automatically. But um, we need to start showing video to computers. We need to start training them to recognize what are the actors, what are the actions, what are the objects that are important. Not every pixel is important. Your face is important. This one is, the ground is not important. The ceiling is not important as I, as I watch you guys, right? Uh, and we also need to have ways to, tr to learn to transfer knowledge. If we, if we train a neural network to do some task, you know, we shouldn't just uh, train it to do uh, one simple thing, but we need to train it to do multiple things. And we need to train it to read what we learn and uh, parse our video and learn our, from our knowledge if we want it to go further. Um, we can just uh, program these things all the time. And by program, I mean show them examples, right? So, um, so in the lab, we, st we started playing with a model of, uh, of predictive coding, which is uh, a model of, uh, of this predictive ability of the brain. Um, this is a model from, uh, from Spratling, for example. Um, and uh, the way it works is basically at the, every layer of this neural network, he computes an error between his prediction and uh, what he sees, in, okay? And then if uh, there's a difference between his model prediction and what he sees, um, he can uh, then decide, uh, he knows that uh, he doesn't know that concept and he should learn it, right? A previous neural network didn't have this ability. So if you show them a category that they were not trained for, they wouldn't know what to do. They just tried to put this category in one of the bins that they knew, even though that's the wrong thing to do. And they should have just told you, oh, I don't know this stuff. You never showed me this thing, but they couldn't do it, right? Um, and so, yeah, working, you know, with Abby and Alfredo recently, um, we came up with the new neural network that uh, are uh, both feed forward, feed, they have feedback, 
and they have recurrency per layer. So they're like a better, better model of, uh, of our brain where all these things are present somehow to sort of look at an image x of t and try to predict what is the what is going to happen in this movie what is the next frame going to look like for example right and so this is uh, from some data that uh, alfredo show you where here you have uh, x of t this is x of t plus one and this is the what the neural network predicts to be x t plus one right uh, and here we show that actually the neural network really uh, learned to predict the next frame as opposed to copy the current frame uh, by, by giving a smaller error uh, in, in the prediction than in the current frame. So, you know, the future is also trying to learn from others, not just predict the future, but, but learn. So, again, if I bring back this, uh, this diagram here, we really need to, to perform action. And uh, as we see that we're making a mistake in our prediction, uh, we need to we need to have a signal that can tell us, hey, you don't know this concept, and uh, and so that that will lead us to learn the best action for every pro problem, right? So so one thing that I think we all uh, maybe you know you guys not so much because you go to the cafeteria, but a lot of uh, a lot of people are still spending a lot of time making food, for example, which is you know fun sometimes, but if you have to do it every day for your family, it gets gets old quick <laughs> right and uh, so a big revolution a big revolution in the future and I think you know the next probably robot that we will have in the house um, is something that can help us here right is a, is a cooking robot something that uh, we can bring uh, hey maybe it just calls a drone to deliver the ingredient automatically all you do is you text him hey tonight I want uh, pad thai uh, and then uh, he starts cooking it for you automatically right um, and not only, but he's trained by this guy who's the master chef. Uh, he has videos of the master chef. He knows how the master chef does it, and he does exactly the same. So you get really good stuff at home. That would be nice. Um, and also, yeah, the way to do this is really to keep playing video games. So the one of you that uh, enjoy video games, like myself, Abby, maybe, <laughs> you know, actually, we recently in the lab, we just, uh, we, we, we bought a video games to train neural networks, so that was fun. Um, so you you can learn uh, you can uh, this these words are very well okay this one is not right but they are very realistic uh, they can be very similar to an, a real world so you can really train stuff here you don't really need to create a robot and have to deal with all this stuff right well that's all I have to tell you today thank you for your attention these are a lot of people that help uh, help us through the years. And these are some of our sponsors. And uh, um, by the way, a lot of this, the work that you've seen here is driven by like a very active community. We, we create tools together. We share the code together. We try to grow without boundaries in the world. Talent can come from anywhere, anytime. Um, I hope it comes from you as well. Uh, have a good day. Thank you so much for the excellent talk. We have time for a few questions.